In the summer of 1940, a small group of young men and their aircraft were all that seemed to stand between the British people and invasion by the Nazi war machine. In the months that followed, the few of RAF Fighter Command would engage the Luftwaffe in savage aerial combat over southern England. In the summer of 1968, some of those aircraft were in the skies again to help film the classic British feature film, Battle of Britain. Now using unseen footage from the production, this series will tell the real story of the Battle of Britain. After the defeat of France, Britain knew she would be next, that she would have to fight for her own survival. The Nazi onslaught would fall first upon the outnumbered pilots of RAF Fighter Command. The morning of the 10th of July, 1940. A German reconnaissance aircraft escorted by ME-109s approaches a convoy of British shipping about to pass through the channel. Six Spitfires from 74 Squadron, based at Hornchurch, are scrambled. Reconnaissance aircraft and its fighter escorts are engaged and driven off. But the Germans are now aware of the convoy's position. They prepare to attack in force. Another RAF squadron scrambles to protect the convoy. British radar detects a substantial buildup of enemy aircraft. A further three British fighter squadrons are scrambled. At 13.35, the first RAF squadron arrives over the channel and spots the enemy aircraft. Outnumbered 10 to 1, they attack. We were scrambled. And I came out of cloud with 18,000 feet underneath 5109s. And they could see me coming for the last 500 feet of my climb. As I came out of cloud, they hit me from in front and behind at the same time. How they did uh, that without crashing into each other, I do not know. The Battle of Britain had begun. Other British squadrons join the battle. Though outnumbered, they engage the fighter escorts and break up the bomber formations. My first experience seemed to always be we were being jumped and you pull around and break. In my innocence at the time, I always tried to retain height, so I was probably going round in a circle with very little speed, and I was the only aircraft up there on my own. It was a steep learning curve trying to pick up enemy aircraft. You have to almost adjust your eyesight to it, knowing the performance of your aircraft. For instance, someone would shout break, I pulled round in a steep turn and stall the aircraft. <laughs> you know, uh, 
instead of probably diving to get some speed. It was learning on the job the whole time. By the end of the day, the RAF had lost six aircraft. The Luftwaffe, 13. No ships had been sunk in the channel. On the day that would later be described by the RAF as the start of the Battle of Britain, the RAF had shown its capability. This was largely thanks to the foresight of one man, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command. Dowding was a very austere man. He used to come and visit us at North Wales, but he wasn't uh, the sort of chap you can go up and have a conversation with. He was an intensely sincere man, intensely patriotic, and uh, he loved us, the chaps who did his fighting for him, as though we were children. It was Dowding who, two months earlier, had argued with Churchill about sending RAF fighter squadrons to France. As the German Blitzkrieg drove all before it, Dowding persuaded the Prime Minister that it was more important to preserve fighter strength for the upcoming defence of Britain than to squander it on goodwill gestures to the French. As it was, nearly 500 fighters had already been lost in France and Belgium, and over 250 pilots killed. In Sir Hugh Dowding, we had a superb technician and, and leader, and who had the foresight and wisdom to tackle Churchill, to challenge Churchill, who, who had promised France fighter hurricane squadrons. And Dowding had the foresight that those hurricane squadrons had to be preserved for the defense of Britain. During the time of Dunkirk, fighter squadrons were busy protecting our troops, uh, trying to get out of France at Dunkirk. The army, who were on the beaches at the time trying to get out, were slating the RAF fighter command somewhat because they said they never saw any fighters overhead. What they didn't realize, of course, that if we intercepted their bombers, over there, it would be too late. They'd be dropping their bombs on them. So we had to intercept them way inland over France before they got to Dunkirk. And um, a number were destroyed, of course, that way. And they never got to the beaches. And that's why the army uh, got somewhat fraught, because they couldn't see the fighters. It was during the desperate evacuation from Dunkirk that many RAF pilots had their first taste of the speed and intensity of modern air combat. We were about 15,000 feet and flying around, uh, not seeing anything at all. Then, without any warning at all, suddenly the sky was full of Messerschmitt 109s with yellow noses, swastikas and big black crosses on them. And this was very much a moment of truth because we hadn't seen them coming and they just appeared like that. Um, unfortunately, I was shot up and I managed to get away and escape. What General Vagan has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Two months on from the miracle of Dunkirk, the experience gleaned in those early encounters with the Luftwaffe would be sorely needed. Now Britain stood alone, and it was for her very existence that she fought. The Luftwaffe continues to harass shipping in the channel hoping to draw large numbers of RAF fighters into the air. But Fighter Command refuses the bait, sending only the minimum number of fighters needed to break up and disrupt the enemy attacks.
hitting hard and fast. It is a tactic that seems to be succeeding. At the end of the second day of battle, German losses were more than twice that of fighter command. Hitler was perplexed, irritated. He had swept across Europe and now Britain stood alone. Surely the British would see reason, recognize that the war was lost and seek a negotiated settlement. But Hitler had badly misjudged the mood in Britain. I think the atmosphere about the time of the fall of France was rather strange in that spirit of no one's going to beat us, filtered through everybody. Every attack they'd made, every, every battle they'd fought, they'd, they'd won. In America and all over the world and that sort of thing, there were people who felt, because of what had happened so far, had felt that Germany won't be stopped. They'll, 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 they'll get away with this. Fierce battles continue over the Channel convoys. Keith Park, air officer commanding 11 Group, responsible for the air defense of Southeast England, husbands his resources. He commits his squadron sparingly, but aims to intercept every raid. On this Sunday, the Luftwaffe lost two aircraft, the RAF, four. German seaplanes, clearly marked with a red cross, were rescuing Luftwaffe pilots from the waters of the channel. On the 14th of July, concerned that these planes were also reporting the movements of convoys through the channel, British pilots were ordered to shoot them down. On the 16th of July, 1940, Hitler issued Directive 16. Since England, despite her militarily hopeless situation, still shows no signs of willingness to come to terms, I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England. He made one final appeal to the British, threatening unending suffering and misery, unless they make peace with the Third Reich. Churchill had already given the answer. Britain would fight on, if necessary, for years. If necessary, alone. After three days of poor weather, air operations have been restricted. But German preparations for the landings continue. Thirteen infantry divisions are ordered to embarkation ports on the French coast. Hitler and his generals knew that the invasion, codenamed Operation Sea Lion, could not proceed without air superiority over southern England. The fight against the British Air Force must have top priority, to break the will of the people to resist and force the government to capitulate. The landing will be the death blow to an England already paralyzed and no longer capable of fighting in the air. Luftwaffe attacks on channel convoys and ports continue. German pilots intend to lure fighter command into mass combat over the waters of the channel. Uh, and we have always waited that the English Jäger would come so that we had a luftkampf to come to them. But the English are clever enough to have seen when they saw that there were many German Jäger in the air, then they were just not gestartet. And so we had it. We have das gemerkt, die kommen nur hoch, wenn die Gefahr von Bomben besteht. The commander in chief of the Luftwaffe was confident of success. 
Reich Marshal Hermann Göring was ruthless, ambitious, and vain, a man of innate cunning with an addiction to morphine. His forceful personality had driven the expansion of the Luftwaffe in the years leading up to the outbreak of war. He considered the Luftwaffe to be his air force, and he its absolute master. He also believed the Luftwaffe had proved itself invincible. The simple facts seemed to support his vainglorious assumption. The Luftwaffe had 2,700 operational aircraft. The RAF would meet this threat with a mere 750 modern fighter aircraft. on Britain's coastal shipping continue. The Straits of Dover become known as Hellfire Corner. German dive bombers, heavily escorted by fighters, strike at an eastbound convoy. RAF fighters, vectored into position by ground controllers, attack out of the sun. At the day's end, the RAF have lost three aircraft to the Luftwaffe's nine. The Luftwaffe pilots were learning to respect their opponents. Es mag Sie überraschen, aber ich war nie ein Feind von Engländern. In dem Moment, wo der Kampf begonnen hat, da war es, sah man, denkt man nur an Kampf. Na gut, in, in, bis es soweit war, hat man schon Gedanken gehabt, warum musst du eigentlich jetzt gegen den kämpfen, gegen den du gar nicht kämpfen willst an sich. Aber in dem Moment, wo es dann die Schießerei losging, dann war ja alles vergessen. Entweder er bezwingt mich oder ich bezwinge ihn. Eine andere Möglichkeit gibt es nicht. Dann hat wir gedacht, damit Europa komplett wird, müssen wir England Die kapieren das nicht, dass wir Europa brauchen. Wir werden die als Letztes jetzt auch noch zwingen. Und deswegen müssen wir sie besiegen, besiegen, denn anders lernen die das nicht. With almost 3,000 combat aircraft to hurl against the RAF's stretched resources, Göring remained confident. In his contempt for the RAF, he failed to comprehend that behind the stark figures of aircraft numbers, Britain's shield was far stronger than he imagined. Although the oldest of the RAF senior commanders, Hugh Dowding was well suited to plan and lead the air defense of Great Britain. With his austere and scholarly manner, Dowding seemed to merit the nickname Stuffy, given to him by his pilots. However, he had recognized the important part technology would play in the control of the coming battle. His vision helped develop RDF, radio direction finding, later to be known as radar. The instructions had been given in 1936 to begin building a chain of radar stations covering the threatened coasts of Britain. Fighter Command was a remarkably good organization. The Commander-in-Chief, Stuffy Dowding, was a, a brilliant operator, and he had conceived the whole layout, the whole setup, and, uh, and he ran it perfectly. If Goering had known a little more about his opponent's extraordinary advantage, he might have been shaken out of his complacency, for it was to dramatically redress the Luftwaffe's superior numbers. Radar was, to me, the single biggest technical advance 
that happened in the war until the advent of the jet engine. It was very significant in that we had forewarning of the German formations, their size, their height, their direction. We had a lot of advanced information. Radar was absolutely vital because they put us in the right place at the right time. Without it, I think we would have been fighting one arm behind our back. We could hear the people in the buses looking at the aerials out of the window, our, our masts, and remarking on them and wondering what they were. The whole world of radar was totally and completely secret. You could hear these people muttering and mumbling and saying, they do say that that'll stop your watch. And they do say that if you stand in front of the aerials, you'll be safe for the evening with your girlfriend because it makes you sterile. A lot of my good friends have had very large families since working on radar. <laughs> German bombers, escorted by about 50 ME-109s, are engaged by Spitfires from 64 Squadron and Hurricanes from 111 Squadron. There is fierce dogfighting over the coast, from Portsmouth to Dover. Thanks to radar, no RAF patrol is wasted effort. Dowding had overseen the creation of a control and reporting system without parallel. As information flowed into fighter command from RDF and ground observation, emerging threats were plotted on map boards. Controllers watched and orchestrated the defense amongst the command groups. 13 group in the north, 10 group to the west, 12 group guarding the east coast and the Midlands. 11 group in the front line of southeast England. It was very exciting to watch a raid beginning to build up. 90 miles, 80 miles away, a few little echoes would appear on the screen. And slowly it would get a bigger and bigger mass. And they were, all these echoes are kind of trembling. They, they, heave up and down all the time, and it got bigger and bigger, and you knew, and it, you, it was part of your job to be able to reckon how many. The raid did build up, well, like a thunderstorm. Somebody would tell you that there were 200 plus, 100 plus, 50 plus coming over. Plotting involved sitting at a large table, which was, was mapped. You would be given a, a, a number which would be the number of aircraft and, and, and where they were. And you would put up the number of aircraft and put it on a block and then put the block to where they actually were. 19 squadron at readiness, scramble. The controller would say, two, from readiness three, to four, scramble, three, and off they would go. At Oxford, 310 squadron, control you to come and give you a sizable plot, give you a, a course to fly on and a height to try and obtain. Which was, you know, gave you a great deal of confidence. Different instructions would go on and these were coming and going the whole time. So the atmosphere was quite electric. Starting from a few aircraft, to suddenly having to put up 250 plus was very, very scary. And then the tannoy would still be on, so we would hear them in battle. Controllers and plotters were expected to work through the most extreme conditions. Controller and the ops be, they would say, you know, um, all right, a raid's building up. I suppose they would see uh, everybody with their tin hats on. There was a, a complete uh, marrying up of uh, the enemy plot and the fighters. Uh, but at least it gave you an idea. It, it saved you uh, twisting your neck around through 360 degrees all the time. You had a, a rough idea where to look. But the plotting uh, was a great help. 
with radar, of course, um, we, could, we could be kept on the ground. The controllers could watch it carefully and then at the right moment press the button and get us up there in the right place at the right time. It soon became obvious to German pilots that something was going on. Or else RAF pilots had developed miraculous powers of navigation. We are teilweise mit den Bomberverbänden zwischen den Wolkenschichten flogen. Also nach oben konnte man nichts sehen, nach unten konnte man nichts sehen. Und plötzlich kamen die Engländer von äh, ganz in bester Position von hinten, in richtiger Position auf uns äh, äh, zugeflogen und haben uns angegriffen. Da wurde uns erstmal bewusst, dass da irgendeine Einrichtung äh, sein muss, die also diese Führungsmöglichkeit ergibt. Und äh, das hat man damals äh, ja noch nicht so gewusst, der, der Engländer gegeben. As air combat over southern England intensified, radar would prove to be a vital asset to the RAF. Shortly before 2 p.m., two Spitfire squadrons and one Hurricane squadron are scrambled to intercept a large German raid on Dover. In the ensuing dogfight, the South African pilot Sailor Milan claims two 109s, one of which is flown by German ace Werner Modus. As the RAF and the Luftwaffe become locked in daily duels, British pilots learn to appreciate the qualities of their modern fighter aircraft. One day, the Spitfire landed on the airfield and taxied over to our hangar. And we sat in this thing, and we walked around it, we stroked it. I fell a bit in love with this airframe. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And it was a fighter. You fell in love with Spitfire the moment you see it. And the moment you fly and enjoy it, you've had it. That is your aircraft. Spitfire excelled but under extreme conditions. It responded whatever the conditions of flight, whatever the conditions of load, whatever the speed or angle, it would give you fair warning that it was being abused. And you could do things with a, with a, with a Spitfire that certainly I've never been able to do with any other aircraft. You don't fly a Spitfire, you just strap it on and fly. It is the most beautiful aircraft I have ever flown in my life. You had to be uh, careful on the ground because you had such a narrow undercarriage and it tended to be nose heavy. But once you got the aircraft into the air, it was uh, a wonderful aircraft to fly. The Spitfire had entered service in 1938, only one year before the outbreak of war. Its elegant lines, high speed, and outstanding maneuverability made it an instant hit with RAF pilots. It was a match for the best German aircraft. But throughout the summer of 1940, it was the Hawker Hurricane that comprised the greater part of RAF fighter strength. I would prefer uh, fighting a war in a hurricane than a Spitfire. The hurricane, what do I have to fly? If docile, easy to handle, easy to maneuver, wonderful aerobatic. Yeah. And the one thing about it was, you had to do a very tight turning circle. It was a good old workhorse. It would take an awful lot of punishment, and you had faith in the aircraft. The hurricane was a good, solid, rugged aircraft. It was really responsive to one's mood and feeling and just fitted in. Although the Spitfire dominates the popular memory of the Battle of Britain, far more hurricanes were in the skies over England. 19 squadrons were equipped with Spitfires, but 34 flew hurricanes.
Opposing them was the ME-109, the Luftwaffe's single-engine fighter. Both the machine and a significant number of German pilots had seen combat with the Condor Legion in the Spanish Civil War. Unequaled then, it would now meet its match in the Spitfire. But although the Spitfire was faster and more maneuverable, the ME-109 could climb and dive faster and was far superior at very high altitudes. Yeah. Die ersten Me 109 Flugzeuge, also das berühmte Jagdflugzeug, was ja äh, wohl in der größten Menge gebaut wurde mit, wenn ich recht informiert bin, 36.000 Stück sollen da gebaut worden sein. Und die Me 109, äh, die ersten Typen waren also noch relativ leichte Maschinen, die sehr äh, wunderbar geflogen werden konnten was noch Spaß machte mit, äh, mit Kunstflug und solche Sachen, die natürlich auch für einen Pilot. Und da haben wir schon gehört, die Engländer sind erstens mal mutigere Piloten und die haben auch Maschinen, die Hurricane und Spitfire, die sind besser als was ihr bis jetzt als Gegner hatten. Ich dachte sogar, meine Me 109 ist besser und kann mehr als die Maschinen. Aber unsere Hauptsorge, meine Hauptsorge war immer Benzin. Wir hatten ja nur 400 Liter für die Verteidigung. Und wenn wir, und fliegen Sie mal mit wenig Gas im Luftkampf, wenn wir Vollgas fliegen mussten im Luftkampf, haben wir in der Stunde 360 Liter gebraucht. Das heißt, wir hatten nur etwa 70 Minuten Benzin. Der erste, für uns, äh, ein relativer kurzer Kontakt mit der Royal Air Force, hat uns äh, Hochachtung abge abgefordert. Sowohl von der Taktik der Englischen, die Führung von unten, das war gut, zweitens die Taktik in der Luft und drittens Die Qualität der Maschine. The Spitfire was superior to the Messerschmitt in my view. Uh, the Hurricane was not quite as good as the Messerschmitt. The Hurricane could not cope at altitude against the Messerschmitt, uh, but it could outmaneuver it. The Spitfire, I think, was better than the Messerschmitt. There's an argument about this with the Messerschmitt pilots, by the way. So. It isn't necessarily true, what I'm saying, but it is my belief. Well, the most of it was a good aeroplane, and in equal combat, I, it was certainly as good as a hurricane, despite what people say. Its firepower was better than ours, and their pilots were experienced. While some aircraft would make their reputations in the summer of 1940, others would have theirs shattered. In the coming battles, the Junkers 87, the infamous Stuka dive bomber, would prove easy prey for the Spitfires and Hurricanes of the RAF. The Luftwaffe continues its attacks against coastal targets. Four fighter squadrons from 11 Group engage another raid on Dover by about 100 enemy aircraft. Now in constant action, RAF pilots were learning valuable lessons the hard way. The RAF traditionally flew a tight VIC or V formation. Pilots spent more effort maintaining formation than scanning the skies for the enemy. But the Germans flew a far more flexible formation, the Finger 4 or Schwarm formation. An easier formation to fly in, it allowed them to concentrate on the skies around them. The England are in the Ketten geflogen, also immer drei Flugzeuge zusammen, ganz eng zusammen, während wir in Rotten und Schwärmen geflogen sind, weit auseinander. Und die Engländer hatten eben den Nachteil, durch dieses enge Fliegen konnte ja nur einer, praktisch der Staffelführer, 
den Luftraum beobachten. Die anderen mussten aufpassen, dass sie nicht zusammengestoßen sind. Während wir äh, durch dieses äh, Schwarm und äh, äh, Rottenfliegen eben schön auseinander äh, geflogen sind und äh, dadurch große taktische Vorteile hatten. Was ich auch noch sagen möchte, die Royal Air Force flog damals auch noch in Freeship Formation. Hat dann aber gewechselt auf Vorship, weil das flexibler war. Und das haben wir alles mitgemacht oder miterlebt und äh, hatten auch die, äh, die Vorteile und die Nachteile der Einzelmaschinen erlebt. As the air fighting intensified, factories worked round the clock to produce new aircraft. And the civilian repair organization worked hard to repair damaged machines, rebuilding some 160 aircraft in a week. In some cases, on a while-you-wait basis, ready for flying again the same day. Dowding and Park continued to nurse their fighter strength, making full use of the warning command and control systems to give their squadrons every advantage when intercepting much larger enemy formations. 19 squadrons scramble. Vector. But now, Fighter Command itself and the weapons upon which it relied were about to become the target. On the 1st of August, Hitler issued Directive 17. The German Air Force is to overcome the British Air Force with all means at its disposal and as soon as possible. The attacks on channel convoys and coastal defences had been only the opening act skirmishes to test the aerial defense of Britain. Now the Luftwaffe had clear orders and a timetable. The campaign to destroy fighter command and expose Britain to bombing and invasion was about to begin in earnest. In the summer of 1940, Britain possessed the most advanced and sophisticated air defense system in the world. Radar, assisted by the 30,000 volunteers of the Observer Corps and the command and control system which relayed this information, would give the pilots of fighter command a crucial advantage. On the ground, experience was being gained in the cauldron of battle. It was vital that every link in the command and control chain worked. Ground staff and aircrew both learned quickly. Ground control was pretty good, but it wasn't perfect. And although you were say, told to vector 080, 50 bandits ahead, it didn't always work out that way. You were spending most of your time trying to find these damn things. I was number two to the leader, red two. We went up and we patrolled up and down the same heights we told the enemy were, which again was stupid, you want to be above them. We patrolled up and down the sun, which is even more stupid. We hadn't worked that one out. In fact, after one occasion, we turned from down sun to up sun to find there's only nine of us left. We started off with 12. Later, we found that uh, one of the pilots had been shot down, killed. Luftwaffe crews prepared their aircraft for an intensive period of operations expected to begin on the 13th of August, codename Eagle Day. To pave the way, Goering had ordered an attack on the radar masts. Finally realizing the role of these tall towers and the buildings clustered around them, but maybe not their crucial importance, it was decided to destroy them, denying the RAF whatever information they had been providing. Stuka dive bombers would be assigned the task of knocking out these modern watchtowers. The Stuka, you know, they, they, were, they were really the biggest menace in the Second World War. They not only dive bombing, but also the noise, which was, oh, it was demoralizing. Mm -hmm. 
German aircraft head for the English coast. The British respond with the same limited numbers the Luftwaffe now expect. Spitfires from Biggin Hill are the first into action. Some of the bombers get through and make their attacks. Five radar stations are badly damaged in the attacks. For nearly six hours, there is a massive blind spot in the country's defenses. Next, three of the RAF's forward airfields come under attack. Lymph, Hawkinge and Manston. I looked down and the airfield had disappeared because 30 Dorniers had laid 300 bombs all over it, you see. And all you could see was an enormous splurge of black smoke and grey smoke and brown smoke. And I remember thinking, the silly blighters, what have they done to our airfield? Where am I going to land now? Our three ton lawyer said, Don't collect us and take it up to the mess to book in. And, you know, halfway up to the mess, the airfield was raided. The hangars were bombed, they were flattened, and I thought, this is quite a, uh, an exciting sort of time, isn't it? Some Spitfires refuelling and rearming are destroyed on the ground. Those that are still airworthy are rushed back into the air in time to catch some of the raiders as they head for home. The RAF airfields at Manston and Hawkinge have been particularly hard hit. And eventually we landed, and uh, I remember racing between the bomb holes, so sort of weaving like a dirt track rider between the bomb holes. Nobody was in the least bit upset. I suppose there were a hundred holes on the airfield itself, kind of apart from all the buildings which had been destroyed, including a lot of 25 squadron of Blenheims. All the bomb holes were filled in and the unexploded bombs exploded. The thing that I remember particularly about it was that they cut off uh, all the water, so nobody was able to wash for a couple of days. Goering had decreed that the following day, the 13th of August, would be Adlertag, Eagle Day. The all-out aerial onslaught on the British Isles would finally commence. But Eagle Day depended on good weather for maximum impact. The English summer now intervened. Cloud and drizzling rain arrived, reducing the scope of air operations. RAF personnel meanwhile worked around the clock, repairing damaged aircraft and filling in cratered runways. Perhaps most importantly, the radar stations were quickly back in service. Despite poor weather, Goering still hoped to deploy all his forces for the great assault of Eagle Day. The British were ready. 
but the attacks on the radar stations and airfields had proved just how vulnerable their defenses were to concentrated German attacks. Now the German pilots received their instructions. Strong fighter escorts were briefed to sweep the skies clear of defending fighters. Bomber crews were allocated their targets. RAF airfields in the south of England and aircraft factories are at the top of the list. Several hundred German aircraft are expected to be involved in this, the beginning of the air campaign to knock Britain out of the war. From Brittany to Norway, Luftwaffe aerodromes are a hive of activity. First wave of bombers takes to the air, bomb bays loaded with high explosives and incendiaries. Once airborne, they join their massed fighter escorts and together head for Britain. As the defenders rose up to meet the aerial armada, RAF Fighter Command was entering a desperate fight for survival. Bandits ahead, bandits ahead. Come here. In the summer of 1940, a small group of young men and their aircraft were all that seemed to stand between the British people and invasion by the Nazi war machine. In the months that followed, the few of RAF Fighter Command would engage the Luftwaffe in savage aerial combat over southern England. In the summer of 1968, some of those aircraft were in the skies again to help film the classic British feature film, Battle of Britain. Now, using unseen footage from the production, this series will tell the real story of the Battle of Britain. After fierce fighting over the Channel and South Coast, Goering is now ready to launch an overwhelming assault on the aerial defences of Great Britain. RAF Fighter Command is about to enter a fight for survival. I intend to continue the air war against the English homeland more intensively. The German Air Force is to overcome the British Air Force with all means at its disposal. German military intelligence estimated that the RAF had only 300 fighter aircraft left, concentrated in the south of England. The Luftwaffe seemed on the brink of achieving the air superiority needed for a seaborne invasion of Britain. It was a grossly over-optimistic assessment, but it was exactly what Goering wanted to hear. The Luftwaffe was now expected to smash British fighter strength in a series of massive assaults, beginning on the 13th of August, codenamed Adlertag, Eagle Day. The day scheduled for the start of the attack dawned with cloud and mist over the channel. Goering postpones the assault, but the order fails to reach some units. Already in the air, they do not receive the recall signal. Bomber formations fly towards England without their fighter escorts. The RAF are waiting.
Angered by the muddled start of the campaign, Goring orders the attack to go ahead after all. There is heavy fighting over southern England. But Goring is determined to launch a properly coordinated attack as soon as the weather permits. August the 15th dawns fine and clear. Three vast air fleets, over 2,500 German aircraft, prepare to make the attack that will finally wipe out fighter command. For Goering, the decisive day of the air campaign was at hand. From the high command in Berlin to the Luftwaffe airfields in France, confidence was high but most pilots were unconcerned with grand strategy. Wenn ich mich recht erinnere, sollen da also 16 16 1600 Einsätze geflogen geworden sein. Wir haben das gar nicht so besonders empfunden. Es war, es war schon ein Großeinsatz, aber wir haben das nicht so als Adlertag oder Eagle Day gesehen, sondern es war eben ein ganz normaler Einsatz mit etwas mehr Flugzeugen. The plan was simple. Bombers would strike at RAF airfields, aircraft factories and war essential infrastructure. Massed fighter escorts would fly high above the bombers, attacking with the advantage of height when RAF fighters attempted to intercept the bombers. At 11.30 a.m., Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers with a heavy escort of Me-109s cross the channel and attack the forward airfields of Lymph, Hawkinge and Manston. Fifty-four squadron Spitfires are scrambled alongside Hurricanes from the 501 squadron. These units will be in almost constant action over the following days. But the dive bombers hit buildings and hangars and sever the cables carrying power to three of the radar stations on the Kent coast. There is now a blind spot in the warning system. With the Luftwaffe command convinced that British fighter strength is now concentrated in the south, it sends Air Fleet 5, based in Norway, across the North Sea. The fleet of Heinkel bombers head towards the northeast coast of Britain. Confident there will be no opposition, they fly without ME-109 fighter escort. But the British radar stations that face out across the North Sea have registered their approach. The information is passed to the fighter squadrons of 13 Group. As the German bombers approach the Tyneside coast, the weather is fine and clear. Spitfire pilots of 72 Squadron, vectored into position by ground control, spot the Heinkel bombers as they approach. From a perfect attack position, the Spitfire strike, diving out of the sun. Hurricanes from 79 and 605 squadrons join the fray. In desperation, the bombers jettison their bombs and turn back towards their distant bases. German air gunners fight back desperately, hammering away with their 7.9mm machine guns as swarms of British fighters buzz past at 300 miles per hour. They could be brutally effective, as some were to discover. I can recall one bomber interception. In this particular instance, the bombers were coming in and we were at right angles. I turned in with my 
flight and told the CO I was uh, going ahead on attack and then I'd go round to the rear. We uh, knocked down two in the head on attack and uh, went round to the rear and I, I went in after my third one. I went in really close and I went in sort of, you know, 150 yards or so. And of course he got me. Severely mauled, with 30 aircraft lost and many badly damaged, Air Fleet 5's participation in the Battle of Britain was over. 13 groups' casualties suffered only three damaged fighters. But over southern England, meanwhile, a more finely balanced battle was raging. As German bombers in the northeast struggled back to their bases, more German aircraft gathered over the Pas de Calais to launch raid after raid across the channel. Bombers escorted by large numbers of 109s strike at targets throughout southeast England. Two, four, 50 plus, speed, four, four. Northwest W for William, two, two, three, nine. RAF fighters battle to break up incoming bomber formations, but cannot penetrate the massive fighter escort. The bombers reach their targets. Two, two, three, nine. The airfield at RAF Martlesham is bombed and put out of action. Further raids sweep in, North swamping 11 w Group's ground controllers. 2239. 2239. Two, but still, each incoming raid is met by heavily outnumbered RAF fighters attempting to hit the bomber formations. To the west, large formations of aircraft are detected heading for Portland and Southampton. Squadrons from 10 Group rise to meet them. Nearly 150 fighters throw themselves at the Luftwaffe formations as fighting spreads along the English coast. Not knowing what the hell was happening in the sky around me, I just did not know. I hadn't seen anything. I didn't know what had been happening. Then all of a sudden, the sky was full of things with black crosses on them. And we exploded like a bomb and went every direction imaginable, just trying to avoid them. It became a one-to-one -one after all. You were attacking an enemy aircraft, or he was attacking you, in which case you were trying to get out of his way. But if you were attacking him, you concentrated on him. And of course, he was going all over the sky trying to evade you. And uh, you all, got, apart from the two of you, you got separated from everybody else. I thought, well, this is it. And I turned my guns on, I fired at him, and he turned over and dived down towards the sea. This is fantastic because before we went up, I was absolutely convinced that I'd be killed. And when you disposed of the chap you were attacking, you looked around and you couldn't see another aircraft in the sky because everybody had scattered off in different directions. But a lot of time was spent trying to get into the right, even when you sighted your bombers. You didn't want to be below them, you wanted to be above, you wanted, if possible, to be into the sun. So a lot of time was spent on following this, the, your squadron commander around the sky, trying to get into a favorable position to, to attack. I was recognized on the worst pilots in the squadron. And having shot something down myself, I thought, this is something. But as I followed him down, another one got behind me and started shooting at me, but he was up. A terrible shot, and he never hit me at all. This man overshot me, so I finished up in the same position behind the second one. So I settled down behind him, and I shot him down as well. Also, my first friend's experience 
Wir haben in Staffelstärke mit zwölf Maschinen im Kanal geübt und haben plötzlich gesehen, dass eine englische Staffel auch vor Dover geübt hat. Natürlich haben wir aus dem Übungsflug sofort einen Feindflug gemacht. Wir hatten ja immer Motivation am Kanal dabei und äh, haben die englische Staffel angegriffen. Und ich habe als Ziel gehabt den sogenannten Weaver. Der flog hinten rein. The fighting over the Solent and Portland is fierce. Two Hurricane Squadrons scrambled from Exeter are heavily engaged. Losses on all sides are heavy. After an afternoon of furious and continual combat, the Luftwaffe launched their final raids of the day against airfields at Croydon and West Morley. The Luftwaffe had used almost 2,000 aircraft in repeated sorties in their effort to destroy fighter command in the air and on the ground. They have caused considerable damage to RAF airfields and facilities, but have suffered heavily in the process. The Luftwaffe loss rate was so high on this day that German air crews would refer to it as Black Thursday. Als Soldate, den man ja war, war man sich im Klaren, dass es Verluste gibt. Und äh, die Verluste musste man eben akzeptieren. Das ist nun mal im Krieg so. Und äh, ich kann mich eigentlich nicht erinnern, dass das irgendwie, äh, sagen wir, auf den Kampfwillen und auf den Kampfgeist uns ausgewirkt hat. Wir waren nach wie vor entschlossen, die Kämpfe zu bewältigen und auch und, äh, siegreich zu sein. Und damals waren wohl in zwei Wellen über England mehr wie 1000 deutsche Maschinen. Und dieser Tag hat sowohl auf deutscher Seite als auch auf englischer Seite viel Verluste gebracht. Aber wir kamen wieder ungeschoren durch an dem Tag. The attacks on RAF airfields and installations continue. RAF training manuals, with their out-of-date tactical lessons, are being torn up. Pilots replace complex, detailed regulations with their own simpler mantras. Wait until you see the whites of their eyes. Always turn and face the attack. Never fly straight and level in the combat area for more than 30 seconds. Go in quick, punch hard, get out. Flight Lieutenant James Nicholson, badly wounded and his aircraft in flames, delays bailing out of his blazing machine to pursue and shoot down another enemy fighter that crosses his path. Badly burnt, he wins Fighter Command's first and only Victoria Cross. The reality of air combat was the swooping ambush, the bounce, hitting sudden, hard and fast. Many pilots were shot down by an attacker they never saw. I joined a squadron with a particular pilot and I saw him going down in frames probably about seven days later. So it is a very sobering thought that you are vulnerable. To start with, in your innocence, you don't really know you are, but it only needed, you know, half a dozen flights when you came in contact 
with the enemy that you realize you were in a dangerous game and they were playing for keeps. Brought it through my shoulder from the front. Had the cannon shell came in from behind and exploded on my parachute that I was sitting on. Uh, and put a lump through a foot which split my Achilles tendon, so I had minus right leg. A bullet came through the armor piercing behind and went through my watch, which annoyed me, into my hand, left hand. Uh, I had a couple skimmed my shins in front. The engagement initially only lasted a couple of seconds. And then you would then break away and then attack them uh, individually again until either you were out of ammunition or, for one reason or another, you weren't able to attack anything. Um, don't forget that uh, we only had 15 seconds worth of ammunition in both the Hurricane and the Spitfire. So uh, if you attacked once, twice, three times, most of your ammunition was expended. And you were then the best thing you could do is to get home and rearm, refuel, and get up again. I suddenly saw a lot of black spots. I thought there were oil specks on the windscreen, but they rapidly turned into one of mines going the opposite direction, one of which passed so low over me I could see the oil streaks on the fuselage and almost count the rivets in his wings and so on. And uh, we, we passed in opposite directions there. They were pretty smart and experienced, of course, and they turned around quite quickly and dived down to attack us. But the chap who attacked me missed and shot past, and uh, so I managed to get on his toe and shoot him down, rather to my surprise. And, and in fact, uh, one got a bit worried, who said his chums will have seen that and it will have made them very angry. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Several large raids target 11 Group's airfields and radar stations. Losses are very heavy on both sides. The faster Spitfires are being ordered to engage the fighter escort. Hurricane squadrons go after the bombers. Some pilots are only now realizing the implications of their actions. When I shot down this aircraft and the rear gunner bailed out, got caught over the tail, and I saw the aircraft go in with him, drag down. That was the first time it really got into it that I was shooting at a person. Up to that point, obviously it'd been vaguely in there, but certainly during the Battle of Britain, I was only shooting at aircraft. That there were people involved virtually didn't come into it. Even if someone bailed out, it didn't, didn't really, I was just shooting at aircraft, that's all. When they had their first uh, auf eigene Initiative uh, mit unserer eigenen Sender uns gesagt, fliegt zum Tiefangriff nach Menzen. Dort sind jetzt am Boden zahlreiche englische Jäger, Spitfire und Hergen zum Tanken und Nachtanken. Ich hatte damals eine Maschinengewehrmaschine. Ich habe aus großer Höhe geschossen und sah, wie meine Kugeln auf, die, auf dem Betonboden von Menschen in, abgespritzt sind. Ich flog dann auf einen Tankwagen zu und habe gesehen, wie ich einen Mann getroffen hatte, der hielt den Tankschlauch. Zu einer Spitfeuer. Ich habe noch gesehen, wie der Tankwagen brannte. Ich habe gesehen, wie die Spitfire. Aber ich habe auch gesehen, nach der Landung gefreut, dass ich erfolgreich war, bezogen auf die Maschinen. Aber ich habe mich schlecht gefühlt, dass ich zum ersten Mal sichtbar einen Menschen erschossen habe. 
Time and again, RAF fighters were hurriedly refueled, rearmed, and returned to battle. Ground controllers attempted to vector them into favorable attacking positions amongst the countless hostile contacts. The Germans must have been frustrated uh, to the, in the extreme. In, 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 in other words, uh, they, they must have said to one another, where the hell do they keep coming from? And of course, we'd got them taped. Casualty rates amongst the pilots and air crew of both sides were climbing dramatically. In the fighting of the 18th of August, the RAF lost 30 fighters with 10 pilots killed. The Luftwaffe lost 71 aircraft and 94 aircrew. But the British summer was about to intervene, bringing a much needed respite for RAF pilots and the chance for commanders on both sides to reflect on the campaign so far. On the 19th of August, after a week of intense air combat, a spell of bad weather prevented major flying operations. Both sides took advantage of this respite to evaluate their tactics. In spite of Goering's boast to Hitler, the RAF had not succumbed. Goering, himself a fighter ace of the First World War, rebuked his fighter pilots, criticizing what he saw as their lack of aggression. He replaced the older commanders with younger, more hawkish officers. We have reached a decisive period of the air war. Our first aim is to destroy the enemy fighters. If they no longer take to the air, we shall attack them on the ground or force them into battle by directing bomber attacks against targets within range of our own fighters. In Britain, Dowding, Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command, redeployed his battered squadrons, principally those of 11 Group, which had borne the brunt of the fighting. Exhausted units were rotated with fresh squadrons from quieter sectors in the north and west. Gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that at long last we have 12... Keith Park, commander of 11 Group, had so far orchestrated a dogged resistance with limited resources. He had ordered controllers to send the minimum of aircraft to attack enemy fighters, emphasizing that enemy bombers must be engaged at every opportunity. Be aware of the Hun in the sun. Interceptions must be made quickly before the bombers reached their targets. And he wanted squadrons from 12 Group, based in the Midlands, to patrol and protect his airfields while his squadrons were away tackling incoming raids. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. All our hearts go out to the fighter pilots, whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day. I hope, indeed I pray, that we shall not be found unworthy of our victory if after toil and tribulation it is granted to us. For the rest, we have to gain the victory. That is our task. But the constant challenge of aerial combat was taking its toll on the field. The demand on pilots during 1940 was very great. The pilots in squadrons were um, scrambling, being, being scrambled almost all the day through. They were really flying their, their guts out. My overriding memory of the Battle of Britain is tiredness, incredible tiredness because we were on readiness from half an hour before dawn in the morning until half an hour after dusk at night. In dispersal art, we had a bunch of um, 
camp beds which you threw ourselves on and went to sleep as soon as you landed. In fact, at that stage of my life, uh, I went to sleep standing, sitting all over it was. And we slept in our clothes uh, down at dispersal. And down we actually slept underneath the wings of our airplanes. Otherwise, we would sleep in dispersal huts next to our airplanes. We very seldom slept at the mess, the officer's mess or the sergeant's mess, wherever we were located. And uh, I don't suppose I slept in the mess more than a couple of nights in the whole of a year. My batman shook me awake one morning and he'd taken the blackout curtains down off the window and he said, uh, I suppose you were awake all night. And I said, no, why? And he said, well, look out of the window. And there was a, a, a string of bomb craters across the garden right outside the window. And I hadn't heard a bomb. I hadn't heard the anti-aircraft firing or anything. I was just asleep and that was it. The poor weather persists. Unable to launch full-scale raids, the Luftwaffe resort to hit-and-run sorties by small groups of aircraft. The Luftwaffe pilots, too, were feeling the strain of daily sorties across the waters of the channel. Also muss ich das Fahrwerk drin lassen und dann auf dem Bauch landen. Das Flugzeug war natürlich kaum beschädigt, nur der Motor war eben kaputt. Und wir haben dann das Flugzeug geborgen, neuen Motor rein und dann ging es dann nach einer gewissen Zeit wieder weiter. Ich persönlich muss für mich sagen, ich habe nie Stress erlebt. Ich bin trotzdem ein Opfer von der Kanalkrankheit. Die deutschen Luftwaffenärzte haben äh, schon gesprochen davon, dass es von zu vielen Fliegen zu vielen Feinflügen kommt. Da haben wir also keinen Zusammenbruch oder physische Reaktion gesehen, die ihm das nicht möglich macht. Äh, Im Gegenteil, er hat sich konzentriert. Er war scharf konzentriert auf die Aufgabe, die er jetzt die nächsten eineinhalb Stunden zu erfüllen hat. Nicht wahr? Und man hat natürlich gewusst über die Gefährlichkeit, aber das wurde zur Gewohnheit. The German bomber crews, who have suffered heavy losses, criticized their fighter escorts for failing to protect them. But ordered to escort bombers to targets inland, German fighter pilots had to keep a careful eye on their fuel gauges. They were accused of avoiding combat to conserve their fuel. And uh, es war immer vorher vereinbart, ein Treffpunkt sagen wir über Kuhekel, um 4000 Meter um 10 Uhr. Und wenn wir um mit den 109 um 10 Uhr in 4000 Meter über Hochel waren, dann kamen die Bomber nicht um 10 Uhr, sondern um 10.30 Uhr. Und wir hatten schon 30 Minuten Benzin verflogen, das uns später gefehlt hat. Wir haben dann langsam dazugelernt und sind erst gestartet, wenn die Bomber über den Platz waren und da wir schneller waren und schneller steigen konnten, haben wir sie immer erwischt. On the 24th of August, the weather began to improve. The Luftwaffe resumes its attacks against key RAF airfields and sector stations the heart of the defense system. Massive formations of aircraft stream towards their targets. For the RAF, the battle's most critical phase was beginning. Sheer weight of numbers frustrates the attempts of outnumbered RAF pilots to disrupt the raids. and the RAF base at Manston are the first targets. 
11 groups airfields and sector stations, not for the first time, are in the front line. Manston, its airfield cratered and littered with unexploded bombs, has to be abandoned. With 11 groups fighter squadrons attempting to intercept several heavy raids across the southeast of England, their airfields are left badly exposed. Urgent calls are made to 12 Group to provide cover. Squadrons from Duxford scramble, but then take precious time to gather information before heading to confront the enemy. Duxford's big wing, as it becomes known, arrives too late. By the end of the first day of renewed fighting, the RAF have lost 22 aircraft to the Luftwaffe's 38. But one raid was to help escalate the battle and drag the civilian population deeper into the conflict. The night of the 24th of August. A small formation of Heinkels fly up the Thames to bomb oil installations at Thameshaven. In the darkness, they overfly their target and stray over central London. There, in direct violation of orders, they release their bombs. Fires rage at the West India Dock. By this stage of the battle, more than 1,000 British civilians have been killed by the Luftwaffe in raids all over the country. Despite orders to attack only war essential targets, it was impossible for the Luftwaffe to hit these, especially in cities, without killing civilians. The bombers were not accurate enough. But this latest provocation was the last straw. Now the British War Cabinet authorized retaliatory raids on Berlin. Early the next morning, large fighter sweeps by German aircraft over Sussex are ignored by RAF controllers. As instructed, they save their strength for the bombers that follow. Northwest Vic Y Vic By the day's end, 20 German aircraft have been destroyed for the loss of 16 RAF machines. And that night, the RAF bombed Berlin for the first time. In the days that followed, the battles between the RAF and the Luftwaffe intensified. As another massive raid builds over France and then heads for England, Keith Park, officer commanding 11 Group, orders every squadron he has available into the air. RAF pilots have been instilled with the importance of getting airborne as quickly as possible. Every second is vital to gain sufficient altitude. Once again, 12 Group is asked to protect the southern airfields. Again, the support arrives too late. Furious at the lack of cooperation from 12 Group. So there could be no further misunderstandings, he instructed his controllers to ensure all future requests for support from 12 Group went via Fighter Command headquarters. Tensions were beginning to grow between the British commanders. Meanwhile, losses continued to mount.
Brigan Hill, Croydon and Hornchurch are all bombed, as RAF fighters struggle to reach the bombers through a heavy screen of ME-109s. Sector stations are put out of action. As aircraft clash overhead, personnel work desperately on the ground to repair the damage to the command and control system. It was the day of the RAF's heaviest losses. 39 machines destroyed, for 41 German aircraft brought down. 14 RAF pilots were listed killed or missing. Since the battle began, 205 RAF pilots have been injured. 222 have been killed. It is a rate of loss that is becoming unsustainable. As 11 groups airfields come in for yet more punishment, their fighter squadrons initiate large dogfights over Kent and Sussex. Aircraft factories are also under constant Luftwaffe attack. But losses to fighter command's fighter strength are nevertheless being made good by industry. Mounting pilot losses were the primary concern. At the beginning, we were losing the best squad uh, pilots, you know, uh, the more experienced and the ones who'd had the experience. And, and then, our, then our replacements came in. And I wouldn't allow them to fly until either myself or my other flight commander. I mean, I remember I was acting CO, but I was also a flight commander. Uh, one of us, Killy or myself, would take them up and give them the best we could, um, a camera gun and uh, combat tactics. Although we'd had a lot of new ones posted in, how can they cope? I mean, these chaps would come in and they'd sit down, they'd probably only done seven hours on the Spitfires, if that. And they watched us taking off with everything we'd got and coming back two pilots short and every time we took off. Um, their nerves must have been shot to blazes. I don't know how they coped. I couldn't, I don't think. <laughs> Dowding was desperately worried. Deeply concerned at the loss of life amongst the young men of his fighter squadrons, he also recognised the reality behind the losses. Pilots are no longer being produced in sufficient numbers to fill the gaps in the fighting ranks. The situation is extremely grave, it must be realised. We are going downhill. Goering had been humiliated when bombs fell on Berlin. He had publicly promised such a thing would never happen. Hitler was furious. The landings planned for the British mainland could not take place until Goering's Luftwaffe had gained control of the air over southern England. Provoked and enraged, Hitler removed his restrictions on attacking London. He announced his intentions in front of a delighted and enthusiastic audience. When the British Air Force drops two or three or four kilograms of bombs, then we will, in one night, drop 150, 230, 300 or 400,000 kilograms. In England, they are filled with curiosity and keep asking, why doesn't he come? Be calm. Be calm. He is coming. He is coming. The Luftwaffe receives new orders. German bombers would pulverize the industrial areas of London, simultaneously destroying Britain's industrial capacity and her will to fight on. The remnants of RAF fighter command, believed to have been decimated in the last three weeks of attacks, 
would be destroyed in the air by fighter escorts, forced into the air to defend the nation's capital. As day dawned, the radar screens remained clear. In plotting rooms, personnel waited expectantly for reports. The familiar sight of enemy aircraft building up over the Pas de Calais was absent. Pilots began to relax at their dispersal points. But on the coast of France, there was activity. Goering had arrived to watch, in person, his mighty armada of aircraft set off to deliver the death blow to the Royal Air Force and bring death and destruction to the people of London. Over a thousand aircraft prepared to launch the largest air attack ever made on a city. The bombers climbed into the clear skies and met in one vast formation turning for the English coast. German fighter pilots had been increasingly accused of abandoning the bombers to their fate. Now they have new orders, to stand by the bombers at all costs. The communication between bomber and jagdflugzeugen was one of the großen Schwächen der Battle of Britain. We had no funk verbindung with the bombers. The bombers die had a different funk gerät than we. And we, uh, Jagdflugzeuge, we were eingestellt on the ground. We could not understand our frequencies. At 4.15 in the afternoon, Göring, enjoying a picnic and champagne, watches as the immense fleet of aircraft stream overhead. Moving as one vast formation between heights of 14,000 and 23,000 feet and 20 miles in length, the aerial armada appears invincible, impregnable. With the English countryside unfolding beneath them, their target, London, was within sight. We will rub out their cities from the map. The hour will come when one of us will break and it will not be Nazi Germany. In the summer of 1940, a small group of young men and their aircraft were all that seemed to stand between the British people and invasion by the Nazi war machine. In the months that followed, the few of RAF Fighter Command would engage the Luftwaffe in savage aerial combat over southern England. In the summer of 1968, some of those aircraft were in the skies again to appear in the classic British feature film, Battle of Britain. Now, using unseen footage from that production, this series will tell the real story of the Battle of Britain. Throughout August 1940, the Luftwaffe's relentless attacks on the RAF, in the air and on the ground, had threatened to destroy fighter command. But as the Germans switch to a terrifying new attack, the RAF is given a vital breathing space and the opportunity to hit back. Month, huge formations of German bombers have targeted vital RAF installations, including airfields, aircraft factories, and radar stations. Many, such as RAF Manston, are bombed repeatedly.
The outnumbered pilots of Fighter Command fought back against this onslaught. Few in number, they hurled themselves again and again against vast enemy formations. Now, people say to me, how many did you shoot down? Now, I never look back. Believe me, I never look back uh, to see what damage I'd done uh, squirting down the whole row of bombers because we were outnumbered about four to one. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the 110s one one and the 109s one got in one another's way trying to shoot at us. So the, the secret of success and survival was not to fly in a straight line for any length of time. You did a squirt here and a squirt there. Remembering, of course, that we had considerably more uh, targets to shoot at than, uh, than the enemy. One day, I did five trips in succession, and it was very stressful. It was more stressful waiting, uh, trying to read a book or sleep. Most people seem to appear to try and relax and sleep. But you were obviously very much on edge. And in a way, I was much happier when we'd been scrambled than I was <laughs> waiting, <laughs> though I didn't know what was going to happen when we got in the air. I started off the battle being petrified that I'd be shot down on my first trip. I finished up the battle wanting them to bring more over so I could shoot more down. This was because I was only 20 and was very cocky. By the end of August, the RAF had lost more than 400 fighter aircraft. And more than 200 pilots had been killed or wounded. Actually, was shot down behind me and jumped out with parachute, and uh, it, it malfunctioned, so he was killed. But after that episode, I definitely didn't make any more friends, close friends. And I'd already uh, shied away from most. Uh, and I didn't even know the names of some of the people that. Uh, joined the squadron and uh, subsequently got killed. For all the skill and courage of its pilots, Fighter Command was in danger of losing the battle for air superiority over southern England. But Hitler was impatient. He had been incensed by RAF bombing raids on Berlin. Now Luftwaffe intelligence reported that Britain's fighter shield was on the brink of collapse. And so he ordered Goering to proceed to the final climactic phase of the air war against Britain. London and other industrial cities were to be targeted by massive bombing raids. Britain's war industries would be obliterated. Attacks on the capital would force the RAF's last fighter reserves into the air, where they would be destroyed by waves of German fighter escorts. The people of Britain would then see sense, forcing their government to seek terms. Almost 1,000 German aircraft head for England. RAF controllers, alerted as always by the chain of radar stations guarding Britain's coastline, scramble 11 squadrons. They expect this fast formation to split up when it reaches the English coast, proceeding to RAF airfields and installations across southern England. But the huge formation continues on its steady course. The controllers realize it can only have one target, London. 
Okay, try to scramble. Squadrons already airborne, patrolling 11 Group's airfields, are hastily redeployed. A further 10 Hurricane and 9 Spitfire squadrons waiting at dispersal are ordered into the air. The Spitfires of 602 Squadron are amongst the first to make contact with the huge Luftwaffe formation. The RAF pilots are no strangers to disparity in numbers. Outnumbered over 10 to 1, they attack. Swarms of ME-109 fighter escorts pounce on the British aircraft, beginning a desperate, twisting dogfight as the bomber formations fly on. Every available RAF squadron is in the air, racing to intercept, but the bombers reach London. High explosive and incendiaries rain down upon the city's docklands. The east end of London is soon ablaze. There were hundreds and hundreds going over. There was no end to them. And everybody was looking up, and cause my mother, she all, <laughs> when she heard a bomber, she would bury her head in the couch and say, oh my God, help us. There is intense air combat over Kent and the Thames estuary as British fighter squadrons rip through the returning bombers. As night falls, more bombers arrive over London. Sheltered by the darkness, they are now safe from attack. But the darkness offers no protection to the stricken city. Guided by huge fires, they add their bombs to the destruction below. The attacks continue throughout the night. Tons of high explosive and thousands of incendiary bombs rain down upon the capital. My boyfriend and I were standing on the corner saying good night and we could see all these fires. I mean, really, the sky was lit up red. And yonder, you know, you knew, well, that's London. The sirens were going, uh, fire engines. The first massed raid over London had cost the Luftwaffe 40 aircraft. Fighter Command had lost 26 aircraft with 11 pilots reported killed. If they had not started bombing London, and they'd stepped, kept up bombing the airfields, we may have kept up with um, uh, aircraft, but we would run out of pilots. And so, if that being the case, you know, they could have won. <laughs> As Luftwaffe bombers turned their attention to the capital, by both day and night, fighter command was given a much-needed respite. And despite the terrifying destruction wrought at the nation's heart, the new German strategy played right into the RAF's hands. As dawn broke over London, about 350 Londoners lay dead, killed by German bombs. 1,500 had been injured. The German High Command was encouraged. Their bombers had got through. London was ablaze. 
Surely the end was near for Britain and her disintegrating defences. The strategy was confirmed. The Luftwaffe would concentrate its efforts on one target, London. Of course, when um, we see the papers and went to work, they were all saying, didn't London have it last night? At London's expense, the country's air defences had gained a reprieve. Dowding took action to nurse his battered organisation back to health. To overcome the desperate problem of fatigue amongst the most battle-weary squadrons and the lethal lack of combat experience in the squadrons that replaced them, he introduced three categories for his operational squadrons. The first category were the frontline squadrons, to be kept fully operational at full strength and fed replacements as necessary. The second category consisted of squadrons at full operational strength and capable of being called upon to assist the frontline units. Gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that at long last we have... The final category consisted of squadrons in quiet sectors, where experienced pilots could be rested while they passed on their knowledge to others fresh from training. In red sections. As pilots recovered or newcomers gained experience, they would be fed back into the frontline squadrons. Just having his squadrons that he moved about, he could conserve his forces. During the actual business of fighting, when you're, as I say, when you're 19, you're too busy ducking and weaving to pay too much attention as to what you're doing. The, the strategy of the situation, the strategy of the war, and even some of the tactics of the war, you know, you're not too, really too worried about. They don't concern you because you're too busy trying to keep yourself alive. Well, gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that at long last we have 12 airworthy... Battle Harkins. tactics so were refined. What we'll be doing Squadrons were to attack in pairs. Uh, I want, uh, they were discouraged from pursuing Martel damaged planes, to but to find Marine fresh Spectre. targets. We'll be flying at uh, 15,000 feet. I want, uh, Keith Park, Kosti commander of 11 has, uh, Group, which had borne the brunt of the assaults, emphasised the importance of early and accurate interceptions, breaking up the formations, stripping the bombers of their fighter escorts. Head-on attacks on the bomber formations were encouraged. Huge concentrations of aircraft continue to attack London. Number one Canadian squadron's hurricanes are amongst those engaged by the fighter escorts. But this earns other squadrons a clear run at the bomber formations. London was at the very edge of the ME-109's range. Burning fuel rapidly at combat speed, they could spend only a few minutes over the capital. The Endurance 109, the Reichweite, it ging gerade bis London, five minutes, then back. No sprit mehr, it's red light. And we were befohlen, Direct Escort. Das heißt, wir wollten unsere Geschwindigkeit reduzieren und mussten an, 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 praktisch neben denen fliegen, was grundsätzlich falsch war. Ein Jagdflieger braucht frei, die Freiheit des Luftraums, um seine Position zu wählen, die Speed zu wählen und so weiter. Nicht angebunden an den, den er eskortiert. Da ist dem wenig geholfen. Und nun kam natürlich auch die Spitfire oben gewartet und haben, wir hatten enorme Verluste. Despite their successes, tensions had surfaced among senior RAF commanders. Keith Park, commander of 11 Group, believed it was vital to intercept early. 
Using the advantage gained by radar, small numbers of aircraft would hit the enemy as soon as they crossed the coast, disrupting German raids before they reached their targets. As German escort fighters became entangled in dogfights, other squadrons could then attack the unprotected bombers. commander of 12 Group, believed in assembling several squadrons into one large formation, before hitting the enemy with concentrated force and aggression. Keith Park disagreed vehemently with this big wing concept, as did others. OK, it can make a big impact, but it takes time. And the one thing that wasn't available during the battle was time. And we said, well, what a waste of time forming up and all at that time the bombers are coming in and are probably on the way out. And to imagine trying to, sitting around and waiting to form up into a big wing, I'd say would be a total fa would have been a total failure. As autumn approached, the weather became less suitable for air operations. Nevertheless, the Luftwaffe mounted large raids, resulting in fierce dogfights over Kent and London. And the nightly blitz on London continued. In spite of the difficulties of locating the enemy in the dark, attempts were made to intercept these nighttime raiders. The only way you could identify what the aeroplane was was by getting underneath it at night and getting a plan view from looking from underneath up at the shape of the wings. And we slowly flew up and closed in formation behind it so I could get my gun sight onto it and open fire. One or two interceptions later that the Air Ministry were pressed by newspapers as to why I had had success at night. The Air Ministry were determined not to give away the fact that we had effective radar or something in our night fighter that allowed us to close in on other aircraft at night. And the Air Ministry said that I had exceptional night vision. Cat's eyes, cats are supposed to be able to see by night, I think. Uh, that was how my name uh, started. Swiftly, fighter command was recovering. The numbers of trained pilots available for operations was increasing daily. New fighter aircraft were being produced and delivered to squadrons at a rate that exceeded their losses. Reich Marshal Goering, meanwhile, Reassured by over-optimistic intelligence of the kind he liked and expected to hear, believed the enemy to be fatally weakened. Now was the time for maximum effort. A single raid of such overwhelming force that it would bring about London's ruin and the certain annihilation of fighter command. German bomber squadrons rendezvous over the Pas de Calais. Circling above them, the fighter escorts burn fuel as they wait for the huge formation to assemble. It's 
starting from a few aircraft to suddenly having to put up 250 plus was very, very scary. Während die Bomber weiter im Hinterland stationiert waren, waren die Jagdflieger, weil sie ja wenig Sprit mitnehmen konnten, mehr an, an, in der Frontnähe. Um, um nun so einen riesen Pulk zusammenzubekommen, Bomber und Jagdflugzeuge musste man sich sammeln. Da wurden bestimmte Sammelplätze wurden bestimmt. At 11 Groups Operations Room at Uxbridge, the day had begun quietly. The personnel in the underground plotting room wild away the time. The Prime Minister had chosen this day to make an unexpected call on Park and his command. Forbidden to light his cigar within the confines of the underground bunker, Churchill settled himself above the operations room. Its large map and indicator boards reflected the uneasy calm. Watched by the electronic eye of the British radar chain, the German formation continued to mass on the other side of the channel. Bis alle diese Flugzeuge sich zu, zu einem großen äh, Pult zusammengesammelt haben, brauchte man Zeit. Das kostete Sprit. Diese Bomber in großen äh, gesammelten Formationen mit den Jägern zusammen Richtung England in Marsch setzten. Dabei hatte man schon einen Teil des Sprits verbraucht. Und jetzt äh, wurde, äh, wenn die Ziele weit genug weg waren, weit weg waren, war natürlich äh, der Sprit nicht mehr ausreichend. Und wir Jäger konnten die Bomber nicht mehr weiter schützen, weil wir keinen Sprit mehr hatten. Sodass diese Bomber denn dann äh, schutzlos den englischen Jagdfliegern ausgesetzt waren, ohne Begleitschutz. Und dadurch hatten wir natürlich sehr große Bomberverluste. Northwest Vic Y for your for Charlie. Churchill watched as a WAF plotter acting on the information fed through the system moved the markers representing the first of the hostile aircraft to head towards the English coast. With ample time to organize squadrons and alert supporting aircraft from surrounding groups, the air defenses of Britain are ready and waiting for the incoming raid. More markers crawl across the plotting table. Squadrons from Biggin Hill, Northholt and Kenley scramble to get airborne. With radar giving the enemy's course and height and knowing London is the target, RAF controllers confidently position their forces. As the leading German formations cross the coast, the RAF fighters sweep in. The German pilots brace themselves to receive these last few British fighters. The Spitfires dive out of the sun, bouncing the fighter escort. The air is full of weaving aircraft as ME-109s attempt to fend off five British fighter squadrons. A second wave of RAF squadrons arrive, attacking head-on. The bomber formations struggle towards London. Most of the fighter escorts remain over Kent, entangled in desperate dogfights with RAF Spitfires. At this moment, the big wing of 12 Group joins the action. Given plenty of warning, five squadrons of 12 Group, 55 aircraft have assembled. 
and now pile into the fray. With RAF fighters attacking them from all angles, many bombers jettison their bombs immediately and turn for home. But even as the remains of the morning's raid land back at their bases, another, larger formation was mustering over the coast. As always, it is monitored by the watchful eye of British radar. RAF squadrons land on a rapidly rearmed and refueled. Exhausted pilots will only have a few moments respite. The German formations fly out over the channel in three huge columns. The British fighters are scrambled for the second time. Every squadron available to 11 Group is soon airborne. 250 British fighter aircraft in the air and ready. As the cumbersome formations cross the English coast, fighter squadrons from Hornchurch fall upon them. Two German bombers are destroyed before the 109s can intervene, locking the RAF pilots in a frantic dogfight. It is a repeat of the morning's fighting, with one grim variation. The British controllers have assembled a large number of their fighter squadrons at the point where the German fighter escorts will be getting low on fuel. Two 13 and 607 squadrons from Tangmere tear through the enemy formation near Biggin Hill. The ME-109 escorts attempt to fend them off, their engines burning fuel as they push their aircraft to full power. Over London, Duxford's big wing has returned to rejoin the fight. The Luftwaffe has battled its way towards London, losing aircraft to constant attacks. Now, over the city, it is hit by a total of 17 fighter squadrons. Goering's claims of an enemy on its last legs are revealed as a fantasy of bad intelligence and his own complacency. The German escorts, their fuel warning lights glowing, are forced to disengage. The bomber formations scatter their bombs and turn to their bases. Staggering under the constant fighter attacks, the surviving aircraft are harried all the way back across the channel. At the end of the day that would become known as Battle of Britain Day, the RAF had lost 26 aircraft and 13 pilots killed or missing. The Luftwaffe had lost 60 aircraft, an enormous toll, if not the 179 aircraft claimed by RAF pilots. The following day, Goering again claimed that fighter command ought to be finished in four or five days. He dismissed reports from his pilots about the strength and skill of the British fighter defence. But Goering was blind to the truth. His Luftwaffe had been decisively, bloodily repulsed, and Britain's aerial defences were now stronger than ever.
On the 17th of September, Hitler himself recognized that an invasion of Britain had become unfeasible. The enemy air force is still by no means defeated. On the contrary, it shows increasing activity. The weather situation as a whole does not permit us to expect a period of calm. The Führer therefore decides to postpone Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. Now Hitler would try to bomb Britain into submission. London would continue to suffer. Night after night, the bombers returned to the battered city, which burned like a terrible beacon. Strangely enough, we expected to be bombed. That was part of the deal. We knew the Germans had the bombers. The worst part was, first of all, the sound of the um, air raid warning. It's a most frightening, chilling sound because you knew then that they were coming over. And then the drone of the bombers, which was a, a very familiar sound, getting louder and louder and louder, and the guns crash, 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 and then the whistling and, and the bombs falling. I was travelling through London, um, and you could hardly get off the tube trains. Because of all the people sleeping in the, in the tubes. You have to walk, walk, virtually walk over bodies. <laughs> And I also remember the place shaking so, uh, the whole building shaking, and one would have thought the building was going to fall down. You just was in the air raid shelters and you just stayed down there and that's all you did do, petrified. You were frightened to go out. But the danger and destruction did not break the people's will. Instead, it strengthened their determination. After the bombing in London, the shops would be damaged, the roads would be damaged, the buses weren't running. But among everybody was this need to get back into the office that day, whether they walked, cycled, got a lift. And it was this determination to stay fighting we still went out at 7 o'clock in the morning to get the tram to go to work. And, I mean, you couldn't go out once you went in the building because you was too frightened. We just went over the road to get something to eat and come back to work. And then when we came out at 6 o'clock at night, we hadn't got down to the Old Bailey and the sirens would go and you'd just have to run for your life then to get on the tram to get home. The, the courage, the morale of the British people in 39, 1940, um, I, I find absolutely wonderful. Despite their terrible losses on the 15th of September, the Luftwaffe did not entirely abandon daylight attacks. With large numbers of fighter escorts sweeping ahead of them, the bomber formations crossed the English coast. Interception by 15 RAF squadrons is swift. German escorts have to fight their way back. For some, this means a low-level, desperate chase across the English countryside. Others used the 109's greater climb rate to escape the conflict and head for home. 
At the end of a day when the Luftwaffe failed to hit any of its primary targets, they lost 55 aircraft. The RAF, 28. On the last day of September, the Luftwaffe launches a number of separate raids across the channel. RAF fighters intercept each raid as it crosses the English coast. Rather than fight their way through to their targets, the formations retreat, scattering their bomb loads at random. But hidden by cloud, one small group of bombers and their escort managed to reach central London. Junkers 88 begleitet. Und schon am Anflug hat der Führer wohl London verfehlt. Ist viel zu spät umgedreht, hat seine Bomben ins freie Feld äh, geworfen. Und anstatt Wolken über London hatten wir freien Himmel. Und es war voll im Himmel von Spitfire und Hurricane. Und deswegen sind die Bomber nicht auf dem direkten Weg zurückgeflogen, sondern zurückgeflogen über die Isle of Wight. Hat ein nach dem anderen von den Piloten gesagt, zuerst meine rote Lampe brennt. Das ist wie im Auto, wenn die rote Lampe brennt, hat man nur noch wenig Sohn. Nach der roten Lampe sagten insgesamt 21 Piloten, mein Motor steht. Und nacheinander haben sich so 21 verabschiedet. Davon wurden nur zwei vom Seenotdienst gerettet. 19 sind ertrunken. As his pilots perished in the cold waters of the channel, so too did Göring's vain hopes for the success of his Luftwaffe. The German losses this day, 47 aircraft. The RAF lost 20. It was the last time the Luftwaffe would mount large daylight raids over England. Goering had sent his air force against a nation prepared. As the pilots of fighter command rose up to meet the aerial invaders, from the all-seeing eye of radar to the system of communication and control, the pilots of fighter command were supported by an air defense system of unparalleled sophistication, far in advance of anything Goering or Luftwaffe intelligence had anticipated. The consequences were more than 900 German aircraft destroyed. The Luftwaffe lost 3,000 of its most experienced pilots and aircrew, killed, injured or taken prisoner. Yeah, ich in der sogenannten Schlacht über England, Luftschlacht über England geflogen bin, August, September, Oktober. Je mehr war ich enttäuscht von der deutschen Führung. Die deutsche Führung und das, was uns befohlen wurde, war absolut nicht in der Lage und war nicht richtig informiert, die englische, die Royal Air Force einzuschätzen. Die Royal Air Force war viel stärker, als wir angenommen haben und als wir geflogen haben. The Battle of Britain had been won. And although air combat would continue throughout the autumn of 1940, the few who fought in the skies above England had held the Luftwaffe at bay. They had stopped the seemingly unstoppable march of the German military machine and ensured that Britain would not crash to defeat as others before them. They had proved that Britain was willing and able to fight on. By their example, the few gave the people of both the free world and the conquered nations hope and belief in a final victory. Both would be desperately needed in the dark days ahead for there were many brutal, costly battles yet to be fought. 
I was very, very proud to have been taking part in what was going on in 1940 over this country. It had a tremendous effect on me because when I went into that, because of my background, I was immature, scared, afraid to say boot or goose. I was just nobody, and it was obvious to me. I was made to feel that in a way. But after the battle of Britain, I could make decisions on anything. I could do anything and was afraid of nothing. My main feeling, of course, we didn't know it was the Battle of Britain. We didn't know of its historical significance. But I, at the time, or, or now, feel that almost a hypocrite. In other words, these, all these wonderful people died. Some of them were wonderful aces and were killed. And, uh, I had some wonderful friends who were killed. And I feel that now I'm getting, so to say, some publicity or credibility which really belongs to them. I feel enormously privileged in the sense that I must have feel, I feel, I suppose, as same as the chaps who took part at Trafalgar or Cressy or Agincourt or Battle of Waterloo. We happen to be the right age, the right place, the right time. But really, all I am is representing those who died. The RAF lost 715 fighter aircraft. 544 pilots were killed, nearly one in five of those who flew on operations. Amongst those who died defending the skies over Britain were pilots from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Poland, Czechoslovakia, France, America, and Belgium. A quarter of the legendary few were from overseas, a debt that is often forgotten. In November 1940, the Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command, Sir Hugh Dowding, sent a signal to his fighter pilots. I wish I could say all that is in my heart. I cannot surpass the simple eloquence of the Prime Minister's words. Never before has so much been owed by so many to so few. The debt remains and will increase. God bless you all.